Hello, I'm Dr. Randall Seacrest, your host for eOrthopod TV. Today I have as my guest Brent Dodge. Mr. Dodge is a master's in physical therapy. He did his training at the University of Puget Sound. He also has several other certifications, including a board certification in orthopedic clinical therapy. He is also a certified manual physical therapist. Good afternoon, Brent. Thanks for having me. Today what I would like to talk about is neck pain. I think everyone has heard uh, the epidemic in low back pain in the, in the United States and all over the world, really. One of the things that we don't talk a, a, a lot about is neck pain. And I think over the last decade, we as physicians have recognized that neck pain is almost as prevalent as back pain. Now, when we evaluate neck pain as, as physicians, one of the first things that we turn to is the physical therapist to help reduce those symptoms and hopefully give the patient uh, a strategy for re not only reducing their pain at the time, but also re reducing the occurrence of neck pain into the future. So let's go back and, and talk a little bit about what is the physical therapist's role in the treatment of neck pain? Where do you start? Well, as with all patients that we see in physical therapy, we're going to do a thorough evaluation. We're going to check motion in the neck. We're going to check muscle strength, and particularly muscle strength that relates to how the nerves are working. It's such a vital area. And from the, the evaluation, then we can develop a treatment plan to help address symptomatology, to help people get comfortable and know what they can do at home, at work, wherever, to be more comfortable and what to do when they have a symptom flare-up and then design a program to help them for the long term in terms of their posture, their, their shoulder strength, which is a big part of, of um, helping people with neck pain, and then being able to just get back to their normal activities as best as possible, realizing that neck pain can be an ongoing and troublesome problem. You know, it's, it's interesting that you say that because I think unlike back pain, who, which, which comes into the patients with back pain come into the clinic and they're almost disabled by the back pain. I see that less frequently with neck pain. Generally speaking, a patient with neck pain comes in and says, you know, I've been putting up with this for six months, and it's just not getting any better, and, you know, it's, it's not really impacting too much now, but it's just miserable, and, and I want something done about it. I think you bring up an excellent point. You know, the people that I do see that have, you know, strong symptoms in the neck, they are tough to cure, and, and I would say a handful of them end up requiring more of a uh, more invasive procedure to get over the hump. Um, the typical run-of-the-mill neck patient unfortunately amortizes that pain into their life to say, well, I've got neck pain. And they live with that neck pain. Like you said, until maybe either someone talks to them about the benefits of physical therapy or uh, they finally decide, you know, it's affecting their golf game or their tennis game to the point they need to get a little help. Mm -hmm. When you do your initial evaluation as a physical therapist, I guess I'm interested in a couple of things. One is, is, is there anything that we as physicians can do to help with your evaluation? And that leads into my next question, which really is, what do you do on that first evaluation? How do you evaluate the patient and determine whether they're appropriate for physical therapy? Well, in terms of what the physician can do, I think just you know, confirming with the client that uh, physical therapy is a helpful avenue to go when there are problems with the neck in terms of pain symptoms like jaw pain, headache. Physical therapists treat those and oftentimes effectively. So if they, you know, providing them that information, they're going to go in a little bit more optimistic uh, than thinking that they're just going to be subjected to either massage on one hand or heavy weight lifting on the other hand. That there are a lot of new technologies and particularly manual approaches that can help people who have pain, particularly neck pain, that can help them get better, feel better, and then learn how to manage that condition. Mm -hmm. As a physical therapist, what, what are the keys you're looking for to make a decision about which, which therapies you recommend for patients? I'm looking for, you know, do I have a range of motion problem? Is there something that's limiting the ability of a person to move his or her neck? Which leads me to think, hey, is this muscle tightness? Is this postural from years of being hunched over a, a keyboard and a mouse or some other form of work like at a workbench? Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm going to be thinking in terms of uh, their work activities, their hobbies. So I know, A, is this a postural or is this potentially you know, joint tightness, 
uh, soft tissue tightness that's going to benefit with more of a manual hands-on approach with mobilization of the joint, meaning just you know gentle movement of the joint or more of a manipulation, which is a, a high velocity stretch to the joint, or whether it's simply going to be a matter of postural training as it relates to their daily activities and work. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it, it's interesting because when, when we always compare neck pain to low back pain, and there's this concept in low back pain of the red flags, things that that either physicians or physical therapists are always on the lookout to try to determine whether this patient has a more serious problem and something that might need a more aggressive uh, uh, evaluation, such as an MRI scan, maybe some more aggressive treatment even. Is there something comparable in the neck that you look for as a physical therapist to sort of warn you that maybe this patient uh, is not quite ready for physical therapy and may need to see the, the physician again and have a more extensive evaluation? What do you look for? I think there's some similarities with an examination of the low back in terms of pain that comes out of nowhere. Mm -hmm. We always get a little bit concerned. We kind of become a PI to try to figure out then is this a musculoskeletal problem, meaning joint, muscle, disc, that kind of thing? Uh, I think as well, I, I'm always questioning people about you know, any vision problems that, that might be a little bit out of the realm of PT, if there's effect there. Uh, arm pain that radiates particularly with coughing or sneezing that says we have an extremely irritable nerve situation, uh, as opposed to more somatic pain or muscular pain in a zone. This is spreading pain that's, that may be more concerning. I'm particularly interested in uh, bowel or bladder function um, as it relates to the spinal cord which is traveling through the, the neck zone and when there's problems with, with discs or degeneration that's changing the space within the spinal canal, um, if there's potential for, for involvement of the spinal cord that could show up as a bowel or bladder issue. It could show up with uh, funky gait what we call ataxic gait, uh, clumsiness in the hands, things that, and particularly on both sides, it made me think that's not just a nerve. That's not just a, a joint that's swollen that's creating problems with the nerve. That's a little bigger deal. And specifically, if I have weakness through the arm in more than one zone, in other words, affected by more than one nerve coming from the neck, if I see two, I'm going to be a little bit more cautious and concerned that there may be something more than just a single level disc joint problem. Yeah, let's, let's talk about going the other direction. And, and it's very common to see patients who have primarily neck problems come in with headaches. And they're usually headaches in the back of the head uh, that may radiate up. But it's, it's a very specific type of a headache. We call it a cervicogenic headache. Can you as a physical therapist improve that symptom? Do you find that uh, either modalities or a manipulation or traction or even an exercise program, any of those things affect that headache and improve the, the headache? I would say most tension type, and, and I say that as opposed to a migraine, you know, a pure migraine headache, that's a little bit different venue. Uh, but in terms of the, the cervicogenic headache where it's a joint potentially a joint issue. My approach as a manual physical therapist is I get my hands in there and I'm going to work the joints, particularly the upper neck. The top two joints seem to have more of an interplay with headaches uh, and particularly the ones that are behind the eye or temporal along the side. And so there's a lot of work that physical therapists can do at the upper part of the neck that can help with headaches. Uh, there are other headaches, particularly in the back, where there can be a potential crimping of the, of the nerve in the back when the head is held forward. That may become more of a postural um, situation where we need to do stretching in the back to allow the head and neck to, to be upright and balanced atop the spine. Uh, but definitely physical therapists have a lot of new tools and technologies to help with even the headaches that are associated with neck pain. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about this, this concept of modalities. Uh, we, we mentioned that earlier. I think I mentioned it. And, and in the neck, we have all sorts of modalities. We've got the TENS unit that people use. We've got the ultrasound. We've got hot packs, ice packs. Um, I think there's, there's something that, that the physical therapists use called the spray and stretch, working mainly with the muscles and that sort of stuff, uh, and ultrasound. Do you utilize any of these modalities, and do you find that some of these modalities are beneficial in treating neck pain? I think there's always a place 
for modalities in the right situation. I think sometimes they can be overused and truthfully among physical therapists will say, well, we'll use ultrasound when we can't figure out what's going on. That's not always the case. Ultrasound can be a fantastic way, and by the way, that's just high frequency sound um, that can be used to generate a deep heat source, so that's great for preparing an area if something's tight to be able to stretch that structure. Uh, ultrasound can be great for uh, overriding pain, what we call being a counter irritant, where the spinal um, situation overrides the pain so they feel more comfortable. Um, but I think it's often used, it's best used in combination with manual therapy as opposed to a standalone treatment. And when you're talking about manual therapy, you're talking about actually manipulating the neck, um, doing what some folks would, would, would say is similar to an osteopathic manipulation, a chiropractic manipulation. That's the, the sort of manipulation you're talking about, correct? Well, physical therapists do what's called mobilization, which can include manipulation. Mobilization is on a spectrum of something that's very light and gentle, what we call a grade one, up to a grade five, which is, a, a, in this case, a spinal manipulation, if we're manipulating the spine. And that is where uh, it's, it's really out of the patient's control. It's a high velocity, low force or low amplitude stretch to a joint, basically, and the structures around the joint. Uh, and that's, that's occasionally a very beneficial form of treatment that physical therapists would use. Uh, and some, of he, some people would say, well, it's, it's just like a chiropractor. But I always tell people, what I'm about to do is a physical therapy stretch. You may or may not hear a pop. And oftentimes, it's not really the pop. It's the stretch that seems to give the benefit. And, and what about these class ones? Well, you, you mentioned this continuum where you start out very gentle. What, what is that doing? A grade one, if you look at the scale between a grade one two, three, up to a grade five, grade one is a very gentle movement of the joint within the neck. So it's, it's almost imperceptible. And the idea is that you're sort of fooling the nervous system so that it, again, as a counter irritant, overrides the pain and allows those muscles to relax. And as soon as we can get the muscle spasm to relax, then we can start working on stabilizing the joint, working on proper movement, posture and things like that. So grade one, even though it's very minimal movement, it's not a, an aggressive stretch, can be a, a really beneficial way to help people start feeling better quickly. Now, cervical traction. I think that, that we see a lot of physical therapists, and in fact, we prescribe a lot of cervical traction in people, even people who have a pinched nerve, because we, we think that it opens up those little openings, the foramen, and gives that nerve a little bit more breathing room and may reduce the pain, the irritation on the nerve, and perhaps the pain down the arm and that sort of thing. Um, I know today there's lots of home cervical traction units that, that you can either rent, buy, or borrow from the physical therapist. What's your take on, on cervical traction? Do you use it? Do you find it beneficial? And if so, what type of cervical traction do you think is best? Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of times where I as a physical therapist will use my hands to actually create a traction or a, a spreading of the joint mm -hmm. um, to open up the foramen. Uh, not every situation that we'll use traction for is for a nerve-based problem. Uh, you know, if, if a joint's tight, traction can actually help to stretch the structures around the joint and improve mobility. But I find the best application of, of traction is when there is a nerve potentially being pinched where the, the nerve's coming out and the, the hole is small or there's a spur, something's crowding that spot to take pressure off that nerve root. But what I've found in clinical practice is that it's, it's, it's hit and miss. When it works, it works extremely well. When it doesn't, it can be ch very challenging and people can end up flared up and there's, you know, then you have to calm those symptoms. So as, as a physical therapist, the first thing I'm gonna try to do is with my hands determine are they irritable to the point that they wouldn't be able to tolerate doing it at home uh, in an unsupervised setting? Again, sometimes you do it, they feel great, they're appropriate for a home device, and we offer different types of, of home traction systems, some as simple as a, a, a little uh, holster that your head sits in, a little uh, strap that goes up over a door with a weight or a weighted bag, say for, with, with water that will allow that stretch to occur, and some that are much more uh, involved as far as lying down and having a pump that will actually work the neck into traction. Um, and 
you know, I, that's hit and miss too, is which one's best. And I've not seen a lot of great literature, you know, defining that one's going to work better than the other. But when traction works, traction works. And, and your, your approach would be try the, the tried and true simple method with your hands, test it in the, in the clinic, and then if you're getting some response, then maybe try one of these units that people could use on a daily basis at home. Exactly. And is this a short-term sort of fix, or is this something that people can get some benefit over a period of time? Most of what I've seen is, I mean, obviously there's some situations where you do traction, people get relief, their problem resolves because they've stretched that tissue to the point now we can stabilize, we work on their posture, and they manage that situation without the need for traction. But if there's a spur that's not going away, you know, short of some uh, procedure, those people, when traction works, tend to get long-term results where they use that at home on a long-term basis. Mm -hmm. Now, another modality I think that is commonly uh, prescribed for people with neck pain as well as any, any sort of pain in the, in the spine is a TENS unit. Do you use TENS units and do you find them effective? You know, as a manual physical therapist, the first line of defense is I want to get my hands on the area. I want to find out if there are imbalances. I want to find out if there's spasm, uh, any joint tightness. And I want to help to treat those things first. And I want to know if I, I've uh, introduced a benefit with my hands before I put a TENS unit on and think which one actually worked. Uh, but as I'm getting improvements with my hands, a lot of times I may not need that modality. If there's a struggle and there's spasm that's not calming, then I'll introduce the TENS early on. Mm -hmm. And that way I can get the spasm out, then get back to stretching and things, posture that will help that person get moving again. Particularly for long-term chronic pain problems, uh, when maybe somebody's tried other therapies uh, and approaches and haven't gotten results, TENS can be a, a powerful and effective way to help people at least keep their symptoms at bay. Now, we probably, for people who are unfamiliar with a TENS unit, explain to, to them exactly what a TENS unit does. Um, take it away. Well, TENS stands for transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation, a big long word that means we're going to introduce an electrical current across your skin. And we do that typically through a portable a device, though we do have units within the clinic that are very similar, they're just bigger. Uh, the TENS unit that I'm thinking of is, a, is typically a portable unit that a person can literally wear like a cell phone on his or her belt with cords that go to pads or electrodes that you can place on different parts of the neck or upper back. Uh, and those are things that can be used. We, we have settings on a TENS unit that can be used literally 24 hours a day. And we have other settings where we really try to get more of an endorphin release. And endorphins are natural painkillers that our body will release to help fight pain. And those settings typically can be used for up to 30 minutes. It's less comfortable, but it has a lot longer pain relief following the treatment. And, and if, if I understand what you said earlier, you're, you don't jump right to a TENS unit. You really um, sort of try to do your manual therapies, and then in the, in the case when the, the problem turns chronic, you may utilize a TENS unit or recommend a TENS unit for long-term use to perhaps get some pain relief, reduce the need for pain medications and that sort of thing. Exactly, and particularly in, in the acute stage, if a person's having a hard time tolerating any kind of manual therapies, that may be a time too to use the TENS to, to stop the spasm so that they can start, you know, instead of being locked up, then they start moving a little better. Mm -hmm. But then like you mentioned, on the more chronic side, before I, I want to use a TENS unit, I want to see, can I make an impact can I help this person regain motion, posture, strength to get back to you know, being able to manage or even overcome the problem before I, I try the TENS unit? Mm -hmm. well, let's go back and talk a little bit about physical therapy in general for neck pain. What are we talking about? Are we talking about two sessions? Are we talking about a patient with an acute or even that subacute uh, neck pain that he's been putting up with it for six months and finally decides to go to the doctor? Uh, the doctor sends him to the physical therapist. How long are you going to work with that patient? Are you going to train him and then turn him loose on his own, or is this something that's prolonged? I would say for the most part, at least in the population of people that I see, I expect to get pretty good results within four to six weeks. And part of that is, you know, most cases of neck pain, it's not just a simple, like, I got this joint that's not working. A lot of times it's, it's this, you know, lifelong postural habit 
specific type of work postures that people have used and it didn't, didn't happen overnight. It took a while to get there. And so when something's been short and tightened for a long time and it has created an imbalance where something else is now weak, that's going to take a little bit more hands-on work. And then those visits begin to span over that four, six, or eight week period to the point that people are able to work at home doing very specific exercises to help regain the, the balance that then lets them have that better posture and overcome the problem. Now, is, is neck pain like low back pain in the, in, the, in the sense that one of the biggest problems with low back pain is that it recurs. You, you, you get better on your own, but then two years later you may have another episode, and six months later you may have another episode, and we know that 90% of folks are going to have recurrent attacks of low back pain. Is it the same for neck pain? Do you see the same pattern in neck pain that you do in low back pain? I see a lot of people with neck pain, and I see a fair amount of people that have a recurring situation. Now when, when they come back to the clinic for a new episode, it might not be exactly the same thing. And then we have to get back and look at, you know, what are they doing in terms of their work? Has their work uh, demands changed? Has their posture changed? Uh, is this a completely new situation in the neck? Um, but I think there are cases where they come back and it is a, a somewhat recurring problem. Maybe they've had trauma and the joint isn't being held by the muscles well enough, what we call a, um, a hypermobility. Something's moving too much and that becomes a problem area and it's tough sometimes to stabilize that. We do everything we can in terms of building up the back muscles in the area of the shoulder blades to give a nice platform for that 15 pound head to be able to work on during the day uh, and then you know refresh on posture, ergonomics, helping them to be able to manage that, that potentially lifelong problem. Mm. Uh, you know, there's a special, a special type of neck pain that we probably should talk about uh, for a few minutes um, and see if there's any differences in the way you approach patients with whiplash. You know, it's one thing to have a patient who just sort of develops this wear and tear um, phenomenon, degenerative disc disease, whatever you want to call it, and, and just slowly develops neck pain. Then there's patients who have been in a motor vehicle accident who have whiplash, who have persistent pain after either a, um, a rear-end collision or a front-end collision, whatever. What's the difference and how do you approach those patients differently than you do the, the patient with neck pain that has developed slowly, what we would call insidiously, over a period of time? Are there differences? Oh, absolutely. And, and part of that's in the acute phases after whiplash. We're going to have a little bit different approach in terms of our manual exam to the neck. Uh, we're, we're of the opinion that there's likely been some stretching to the ligaments uh, and, and we don't want to add to that by stressing the ligaments. So we're going to probably hold off on our stress tests, meaning where we take a ligament and try to stretch it and see if that's the, the pain generator or if it's leading to other symptoms. We're going to hold off for about six weeks to allow healing to occur. We may end up using you know, a supportive device like a soft collar, something where they can allow their body to heal. The first line of business is support, protect, position, calm symptoms, and then later we can go back in and start you know, looking more specifically at the ligaments through the neck. So that's probably the biggest one is, is our order of examination. I think from a treatment standpoint, anything that we can do to help them position their neck keep their neck from hurting, whether that's, again, using a, a soft collar for a, a short period of time, uh, to the way that they approach their task, what we call ergonomics, uh, very specific exercises that we guide them to say, we're not working into pain. This is all about, you know, pain freedom. Um, that gives that, that whole system a chance to heal, um, and that takes time. It doesn't well, happen overnight. Yeah, and I think, I, think, I think whiplash could be a whole separate discussion. And, and I think that maybe we'll have that discussion one day. Today, I think we probably should, should just suffice it to say that whiplash, that type of neck pain, is different than degenerative neck pain and, and treated totally different. Yeah, it's going to be managed a little bit differently early on and likely later on as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think we've covered a lot of the, the, the basics of treating neck pain, especially the degenerative slow onset neck pain. Is there anything you can think of that patients should know that we have not discussed today? 
I would just like to emphasize again that pain, first of all, isn't normal, nor is neck pain. And if people are having neck pain, that's not something they should just choose to live with. I think there's so much new technology available, uh, and oftentimes we, we can find out, hey, this is the problem, this is the culprit. The, the postures you're using when you're at work or when you're working on your hobby are playing into this. Here's some simple remedies. And people find, you know, they can get really good results in short order for those kinds of problems. And I would hope that they'd seek it out and get, get a remedy for it. Well, I think, I think you've raised the awareness of the possibilities and hopefully both physicians will be more likely to refer to physical therapists and patients may be more likely to request to see a physical therapist perhaps even just call up and make an appointment at a physical therapist. So thank you very much. You bet. Thanks for having me over today.